Our guest today, Congressman Max Rose, is someone who truly deserves a hero's welcome. When he entered the race to represent New York's 11th Congressional District, I'm not sure many of us gave him a real shot at winning. But when you meet him and you learn more about him, you quickly realize that even without the title of Congressman, he's someone you can't help admiring and someone you can't help looking up to as a leader. Max is the first post-9-11 veteran ever elected in New York City, a, decora a decorated war hero who earned a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star, and a combat infantry badge during his deployment in Afghanistan. He continues to serve in the National Guard today despite injuries from combat. He has a master's degree in philosophy and public policy from the London School of Economics. And he's been employed in both the public and the not-for-profit sectors, including for the late Brooklyn District Attorney, Ken Thompson, where the congressman worked to rebuild trust between communities and the criminal justice system. He's tenacious, he's patriotic, he's smart, and he's singularly focused on doing what's right for New York and his constituency. Before we hear from the congressman, I'd just like to take a moment to recognize some of the public servants who are here with us today. Staten Island Borough President James Otto. <laughs> Council Member Brad Lander. Our Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill. And a special thanks to Cesar Claro and the Staten Island Economic Development Corporation for co-hosting this event with us today. I want to thank you all for your service. It means a lot to us, and we are grateful. One last point before the Congressman speaks. His election was unique, not just because of the odds he faced, but because of what he focused on. Uh, he talked a lot less about the troubles in Washington and more about the everyday problems of the people in Staten Island and in South Brooklyn, about the opioid, ep opioid epidemic that affects both the prosperous and the less fortress fortunate districts, uh, neighborhoods in his district, the crushing commute for his constituency every day, and how the rising cost of housing is changing our neighborhoods and making New York unaffordable for so many people who were born and who have grown up here. He thinks locally, but he also thinks big, and that's very much in the spirit of Abney. We're grateful to have him here. Congressman Max Rose. Stephen, thank you for that kind introduction. I should have, uh, should have invited my wife. She could have heard that. We got a little, are we all right? Hit the gym this morning. You know, I have, um, been a congressman now for five months, uh, youngest male congressman in America, the youngest female congresswoman gets a bit more press than me, <laughs> but, but I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> She's my buddy. Um, but you know, there, there's all the reason in the world to feel, get a little arrogant. I was doing a favor for my mother the other day. She's a, a professor at Borough Manhattan Community College, been a professor there for 30 years. Spoke to her student government, and I was sitting in a bar there after. I had about an hour to kill. And the bartender says to me, I love politics. She didn't recognize me, which I found highly offensive. <laughs> um, she tells me, I'm from Staten Island. I said, well, what do you think about Max Rose? She said, I hate him. <laughs> I can't stand the guy. I don't like the sound of his voice. I don't like his face. The only person who hates him more than I do is my mother. I said, well, I'm Max Rose. It's nice to meet you. And she said, oh, my God, the makeup artist on MSNBC don't do you justice. <laughs> we gotta, she says, we got to take a selfie because all roads now in politics lead to selfies. And so we take a selfie. She takes out her phone. She says, you see, you're really not photogenic. So, you know, as I left that bar with, with my ego in tatters, it, it dawned on me, though, the campaign is over. The campaign's over. I am just as much this woman's representative, just as much her mother's representative who hates me, as I am my most fervent supporter. And it seems like that's what we've lost a little bit today. Turn on any major news station, you see a horse race. You see a coverage that is all too often 
trivial in nature, all too often ignores the major challenges that we're facing in our city. Staten Island, South Brooklyn, my district, is amongst the epicenters of many of these problems. Take the opioid epidemic. We're losing on an annual basis more people to overdoses than we lost in the entirety of the Vietnam War. Myself, and I know uh, my friend Jimmy Otto is here, have had to have far too many, countless conversations with grieving parents. Fentanyl streaming from overseas, killing kids, first time they've ever experimented with drugs. Move on to infrastructure. Across the country, we see a similar problem with increased concentration of jobs and populations in, in cities. It causes a massive affordability crisis and a commuting crisis on top of that, a commuting crisis and an affordability crisis that we have been experiencing on Staten Island for many, many years, and now the entire city is experiencing it. I've had my battles with the mayor about this. I know many of you have as well. We, we, maybe we should go to Iowa to talk to him about it. Sorry, it's just, I had to do it. <laughs> but not only is Staten Island's story now New York City's story, but New York City's story is now America's story. The solutions are obvious, gateway, infrastructure investments, subways, buses, it's clear as day to us. But amidst all these problems, a clear narrative has emerged. You hear the 3,500 Democratic presidential candidates right now saying something very, very similar. We got to think big. The days of milk toast incrementalism have got to be behind us. You hear them all say it. We have to have paradigm-shifting thought. And that's even more true when you move beyond the problems that we face today and you think about the problems that New York City will face in the future. Automation is coming for white-collar jobs. The days when finance had to be close to Wall Street, geographically speaking, those days are behind us. Our tax revenue ever more reliant on the 1% is being squeezed by things like salt. Cybersecurity. Massive, massive new threats to our national security that we have never seen before, with nation state actors utilizing non state proxies to wage war on us both indirectly as well as potentially directly. And lastly, we're now at the top of our growth cycle. 10 years we've been growing. A recession is looming, a recession is coming. It could be tomorrow, it could be three years from now, but New York City, New York State, and the country has got to be prepared. But we have a problem if we just say we have to think big. There's a problem that nobody is talking about, and it is the problem that nobody trusts government today. Nobody believes in government. Nobody sees the small successes that will make people think that we could do something big. In this city, we have a problem. It's a problem that not enough people are talking about. It's the problem of people putting ideology before facts, putting their own fundraising before getting the job done. And I may be a Democrat, but this is a problem that both parties are suffering from. The answer cannot be to chase away thousands of new jobs and billions of dollars in tax revenue with fear-mongering and distortions of basic economic facts, a new brand of voodoo economics like what we saw with Amazon. That cannot be the answer with the threats and the issues that we face today. The race to the bottom with corporations, the race to the bottom with market subsidies is a gigantic problem that requires a national solution. But in the meantime, we cannot cut off our nose to spite our face in this city. So long as Washington, D.C. cannot get the job done, and believe you me, I am working each and every day 
to be a part of a success story down there, but so long as that does not happen, we have to understand that we in this city are in competition. We're in competition for jobs. We're in competition for tax revenue. We're in competition for governmental success stories. We're in competition for our nation's immigrants. And we have to start acting like it in this city. You know, everyone wants to talk about the blue wave recently. And a lot of us are misconstruing what actually happened. So let me break it down for you. It was not as if millions of people across the country suddenly came to believe that the Democratic Party is their savior. That's not what happened. It wasn't as if people suddenly believed as if the Democratic Party is the panacea, the answer to anything. What happened is you saw candidates across the country, myself included, earn the trust of people, go door to door, thousands of them, and convince them that it does not have to be this way, that we can truly change the political class, not only locally, but also nationally. And lo and behold, we had upsets across the country. But those were upsets not for the Democratic Party, those were upsets for individual candidates who presented a vision for a better America. And we have got to continue in that vein. I'm doing my best down in D.C. to not only engage in philosophical discussions, but to actually focus on how we can get the job done. We see that with what we just did on the Verrazano Bridge. We're going to pass split tolling. We're going to take thousands of vehicles off the road, not just in Staten Island, but also in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. We did it with federal action and state action and city action. Everyone came together to do it fast because people have been suffering. We're going after China, putting sanctions on pharmaceutical companies that are producing illicit fentanyl and knowingly shipping it here onto our shores to kill our kids. And in the district, on Staten Island, we are getting as granular and as bread and butter as possible, and I am blessed to have a wonderful partner in crime, Jimmy Otto here, who's working with me across the aisle, putting BS, political divisions aside, to actually improve people's lives. And we saw that with soccer season, didn't we, Mr. Borough President? For 20 years, the National Park Service, this thing's crazy, for, na for 20 years, the National Park Service messed up soccer season on Miller Field. Miller Field on the east shore of Staten Island. There's three things you can guarantee in life, death, taxes, and soccer season. But nonetheless, every, to every spring, it took the National Park Service by surprise, and they made the community pay for the porta potties Well, that changed this year. We fixed it. Thousands of families did not have to have that difficult conversation with their kids to say soccer season ain't starting on time. Jimmy and I may be the only two elected officials in the country to do a ribbon cutting for porta potties We got the seawall started, eliminated the last piece, the last bureaucratic restriction that was preventing the city and the state and the federal government from actually breaking ground because for years now, Staten Islanders have been staring across at the seas that decimated their lives, their livelihoods, that of their families, and government couldn't get it done. Now, why am I here, though, in Manhattan talking to you about porta potties soccer season, seawalls, tolling, Fentanyl, why aren't we thinking big? Why am I not talking to you about new deals and interstate highway acts of the 21st centuries and Apollo projects? Well, the reason is, is that without trust in government, we will not solve a damn thing in this country. Climate change, the homeless crisis, skyrocketing inequality, all things that we have got to get done and we have got to get done quickly, but if our constituents do not believe what we say, if they look at elected officials and think that they are just trying to rip them off or ignore them or get rich during office or after office, it doesn't matter how good our plans are. It's not about Democrats anymore. It's not about Republicans anymore. It is about trust. That's why for the last decade, people across the country have only been electing or voting for change. They haven't been voting for a party, they've been voting for change. We can no longer 
make national points of ideological significance on the backs of hardworking New Yorkers. Think about what New York City could be. New York City can be the place where we show the American people that government can work in big, bold, dynamic, as well as small ways. Because when someone's trash is picked up on time, when someone's commute is just that much shorter, when someone has the best, the most well-paid police officers and teachers and nurses in the country, led by the greatest leaders in the country, such as our Commissioner O'Neill, well, then they'll be ready to talk big as well. They'll be ready to sign on. Ronald Reagan said that there's nothing scarier than someone coming from the government saying, I'm here to help. Bill Clinton went on to say, the era of big government is over. George Bush certainly spoke in a constantly antagonistic way towards government, and Barack Obama as well avoided any talk of the ways in which government can be there to solve the big problems that the private sector cannot. And amidst all of this shocker, government stopped working for us, and people lost faith. Well, if we are going to address the bloated budgets and the never-ending wars that seriously threaten our future, those days have got to be over, but we cannot do it if the people don't believe in us. When our soccer fields open on time, when our communities are safe and policed responsibly, when our teachers and our nurses are truly vibrant members of the middle class, then I'll be able to stand up here and talk about the Apollo project for battery technology that we so desperately need to transition our economy to a carbon-free future. Those two things are interlinked in a way that we are not acknowledging nearly enough as a society today. Well, right here in New York City, we can change that. We have to. It's not going to be easy, but we sure as hell cannot afford to fail, and we're going to do it together. So thank you all so much for this opportunity today. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing your questions. We're a little concerned about the census. First, the citizenship question, and that might deter people from sure. showing it out. But generally speaking, a lot of, uh, obviously, state money is allocated based upon uh, people filling out the form. Uh, can, I, can you talk a bit about what we can do to be helpful? And second, uh, sure. how, this, how big a priority is this for the, for the, for the New York delegation? Sure. So let, let's start first with the philosophical here. You know, that we, what I just spoke about was trust. The issues that we are facing with the census begin with the fact that many people, especially in underserved communities, don't trust it when someone knocks on their door and says, I'm here for the government, I just want to take your information. That's a consequence of many things this administration has done, as well as things that their predecessors have. And so all of us have co to collectively spread the message that when that person from the census comes by, it is safe to give your information. That's the first thing. The second thing is we have to make sure that we are properly resourcing the census efforts. It's all too often in, as well, communities that are diverse, underserved, and in urban areas, it's much harder to track people. It's much harder to get numbers, and this has got to be a holistic effort with, involving all echelons of government. Now, Certainly the New York delegation, this is very important. It was important for us to continue to fight that citizenship not be a question, or not be a forced question. It's important that we are making sure that there are adequate resources to fund the census effort because of the fact that this is, if we lose a few congressional seats, that represents a big hit for us. A big hit because there's already an incredible anti-New York bias in the halls of Congress. We see that with SALT, but we also see that with the ways in which our police and our law enforcement is funded. Think about all the talk about what's happening at the border. Border wall, border wall, border wall. How few times people are actually speaking about the threat of terrorism in this city. How little people are speaking about in the halls of Congress the fact that our police department is reliant on federal funds to support its counterterrorism efforts. No, they love trash in New York. The only time they don't trash New York is when they come here to do fundraising. 
but we can't allow that to continue. How would you suggest that we address bridging sort of the communication gap between, like, into discussing these smaller issues? Um, I realize that it's not like we have to, I, I agree with you that you can't discuss big picture so you get people's trust, but there's also smaller things that are happening, like with the opioid crisis is obviously a very big issue yeah. and people are dying. And like I'm, I work on Wall Street and the laws are being broken every day and that's affecting people's income. Um, and that has to have immediate solutions. So in the, in the immediate future, like how would you suggest fixing, like band-aiding those problems now? So that it, it, this is. This is less of a communication gap than an action gap. So then what, what would you suggest that like, people that can have sort of impact in those specific areas sure. do? <laughs> so we have to, first of all, stop looking down on the small stuff. You know, I was recently sitting down with a member of Congress who shall not be named. And as members of Congress often do, I asked him, well, what are you working on? And he said, yeah, I'm really concerned about the future of work in 2065. I'm talking to college professors where I'm doing speeches. He said to me, well, what are you concerned about? I said, soccer season's kicking my ass. Now, it's easy for us to be elitist. It's easy for us to be snobbish and look down on something like that. It's easy for us to think, as the borough president and I were talking about on the way over here, that the other day, during the height of a commuting hour, the Department of Transportation thought that that was a good time to disrupt traffic and paint a street. Because we all too often don't connect that act, the fact that people are living in our NYCHA developments today, waiting years for sensible construction to happen, years for mold to be taken out of the walls. We don't understand that it is offensive to go to those people and then say, we got to think big. Then say, as if you only didn't, you just don't understand, you're, you're voting according to your cultural interests, not your economic interests, and I gotta educate you. People have every reason today to believe that government will not work for them. Every reason. And I think that we have to renew our emphasis on the operations of government to show people that they're connected. it can be better. It certainly can. The, the, the Apollo Project is spoken about so much these days. What we often don't talk about with the Apollo project is, yes, in 1961, JFK announced that we're going to go to the moon before we went to space. But after he was killed, Lyndon Johnson continued the project. And then most importantly, when we had a change to the other political party controlling the White House, President Nixon finished the task. There was a commitment to this, spending 3% or so of GDP, despite economic problems, despite a never-ending war of their own. There was a commitment to doing something big and bold. But people believed. They believed. Um, I was curious to see, I mean, you talked about big and small projects. Could you speak a little bit about what you see as the priorities for education, particularly here in New York, and, and if you think the federal government should be involved in that and how? Sure. So we have to stop looking at education as singularly a federal state or local responsibility. It has to be us together. Now, that, that is not to scapegoat the, the question. The biggest challenge that we face in our economy today that people are not talking about nearly enough is we have nearly 10 million middle class jobs that we cannot fill, principally in building trades, health care, and tech. Supply of human capital is not meeting demand. And that's really for two reasons. The first is, is because our immigration system still is not working as effectively as it should to attract and quickly bring in the best and the brightest. Now, that's not certainly an argument that we should move to uh, a points-based, multi-tiered system, but I think we all would collectively agree that there's plenty of people who could be immediate contributors to our economic growth that are not able to come to this country very quickly. But second, and mo more importantly than that, we have got to connect our educational institutions, particularly our high schools and our community colleges, with these immediate opportunities to be members of the middle class. There, there are examples in Chicago, principally, where they are building out a massive public-private partnership, massive, where they are connecting companies with community colleges, they're splitting the bill, and we're pushing educated people directly into jobs that are immediately middle class in nature. But unions have to also play a vibrant role in this. Apprenticeships, 
partnerships. And we can quickly fill these jobs. I believe that. Um, and think about how we can change people's lives in the process. A four-year college is not for everybody. We have to stop talking as if it is because it, it's elitist in nature. And it puts people off. Electricians, plumbers, in this town especially, all incredible ways to get into the middle class and to do it very quickly, very quickly. Um, to have an education system that is more centered around these things, centered around vocational education, while ensuring that it's equitable. You know, we turned our backs on vocational education 30, 40 years ago because people very correctly made statements that it was racially a racially prejudiced system, but that doesn't mean we can't build a better system for the future. Good morning, Congressman. Thanks for being here. You can um, call me Max. Okay. Good morning, Max. Thanks. Um, you spoke about the need for a sustainable and green future. Um, the offshore wind industry is rapidly emerging up and down the East Coast, and Staten Island's South Shore offers some of New York State's most valuable land opportunities for um, facilities that would build the, and maintain those. What's your position in the conversation? Where do you think Staten uh, Island should be? Don't you mess up our traffic, man. Uh, <laughs> so, offshore wind definitely represents a significant part of our transition to a carbon-free economy, but if we do not have a revolution in batteries, then wind and solar will not solve this problem because there are days and there are times, I guarantee you, I'm no genius, but where it's not windy and it's not sunny. And we've forgotten about the importance of battery technology. Now, certainly uh, you know, in the South Shore, particularly uh, where we have large storage areas, where our peers are, that there's an opportunity to uh, have development around offshore. But what's fascinating to me, because things do come down to politics, I've had, let's say, over the last two years, let's say I've had 100,000 conversations. Some, most of them were very quick, but people come up to me with all types of problems, and never does anyone come up to me and say, look, Max, I have an issue, but it's really strictly a municipal matter, so I'm not gonna bother you with it. They just tell me what's going on. In those two years, 100,000 conversations, I've had very few people come up to me and say, I need a job. In our economy today, Jobs are everywhere. That, that's representative of successes over the last decade. That's certainly not something that could, is guaranteed to be here to stay. But when people come up to me and complain, what they are complaining about is the absence of tax revenue. I'm not paid enough as a cop. I'm not paid enough as a teacher. My commute is too long. The ER takes too long. It takes me 45 days to get a doctor's appointment. My cultural institution is inadequately funded. Complaint after complaint after complaint centers around the absence of tax revenue. And as a city, what we have to do is we have to have the responsibility, and this is on the elected officials, myself included, to be willing to stand up and say, we have got to be a magnet for new industries. Consider the looming threats that I spoke about. Automation and white collar, definancialization of New York City's economy. We have got to diversify and what you just discussed is a great way in which we can because we are adjacent 10, 12 miles offshore to the Saudi Arabia of wind. All up and down the East Coast and there's a competition for who is going to be at the center of that third industrial revolution. And we can be it right here. But that's why I go back to the fact that there is a national ideological debate happening but there is a competition happening at the city and the state level and we as a city cannot afford to rest on our laurels anymore. We just can't. We have to get competitive again, and in that industry is a great way in which we can. Hi, good morning. Um, you spoke a little bit about how in DC there's a strong anti-New York sentiment happening, and I'm curious how we, how we ensure that we're still getting the infrastructure investments that we need here. We need them so badly with you know, gateway funding and others, sure. and, and it's, you know, it's scary if you're in New Jersey trying to get to the west side of New York every day. Yep. Well, the anti-New York sentiment isn't anything new. You know, look, look at it with the Victims' Compensation Fund. The fact that we have had to fight to make sure that cops and firemen and first responders and so many others who are at ground zero in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 should be adequately compensated, shouldn't have to, you know, be worried that these funds are going to dry out. All these folks in D.C. love to tweet out, never forget. 
They have pictures of the Twin Towers in their office, but when they have to put their money where their mouth is, suddenly they become fiscal conservatives. Suddenly they say secretly to their buddies, oh, that's just a bunch of Italian and Irish cops and firemen with Jewish lawyers. It's a funny joke. But <laughs> the, that sentiment is something that I'm not sure if we can necessarily change very quickly, but we have to fight it. We have to organize and we have to, first of all, communicate the incredible way in which we are a multiplier effect for the rest of the country, how we are sending out tens of billions of dollars in tax revenue that we're not getting back. Gateway is a great example, but we also have to change the Democratic Party here, too. Why did the Democratic Party go to Donald Trump to request permission to do an infrastructure bill? We didn't request permission to pass the Equality Act, to pass universal background checks, to pass the Dreamer Act. We, we ignored the president at that point. You know, the days where the American people have said that they want government out of their back pocket are gone. Donald Trump co-opted parts of a democratic populist agenda. He spoke about, when he spoke about making America great again, he was spe speaking about making our roads and our bridges great again, and our airports and our highways. We cannot afford to say, well, look, we're so fiscally conservative, we're not willing to make investments. It's interesting, go to any private sector, any entrepreneur, any business owner, and say at a moment of unprecedentedly low interest rates, do you think it's a good idea to not make strategic investments in the future that you know will have positive returns? And they would say, of course. Of course that's a good idea, but why is the federal government not doing it? We, we can't sit down and pray to the gods of the, the immediate pay for and be afraid of our own shadow to the point that we're not willing to borrow money to make incredible investments in our future. Gateway is a phenomenal example, but it doesn't stop there. There's a North Shore bus rapid transit on Staten Island. There's, you know, finally figuring out a way to put the BQE underground. We, we could dream about a tunnel from Staten Island to Manhattan. We could triple, quadruple the number of ferries that we have operating in our city. So people are not commuting for 90 minutes a day, but 30 minutes. All these things are possible, but we have to front load those investments. Rather, today, what we're doing at the city level is exactly the opposite. We're telling people, you have to pay the price with congestion, you know, congestion pricing. You have to pay the price up front, and the, invest the infrastructure investment's gonna come a decade from now. We see that with zoning, too. You gotta pay the price right now with increased congestion. You have to pay the price right now with thousands of people moving into your communities, and maybe we'll think about the infrastructure investments later on. We have to flip the coin on that in this city. Hi, good morning. I understand your views on uh, different topics facing your constituents in this city, but I'm curious on a bit more granular level, what's going to be coming specifically out of your office to address these issues? And then what KPIs or milestones are you looking towards to make sure that you're making progress on addressing these issues? Are you coming up with different programs, initiatives? Sure. What can we look for? Sure, sure, of course. So uh, let, let's, let's talk about the opioid epidemic first. We, we can't afford just to fight the last war. We have to understand that this is a complex threat where, or issue where people are often suffering from multiple comorbidities. So I led the effort in Congress to increase SAMHSA funding, funding for substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment. Now that's gonna sail through the House. We're gonna continue fighting so it sails through the Senate and the President signs this as a part of a much larger appropriations package. We did the same for fighting to make sure that the NYPD receives the federal funding it needs for, it, for its counterterrorism efforts. And these fights are not guaranteed. I cannot begin to tell you the degree to which they are not thinking about our challenges. I'm leading the effort to put sanctions on Chinese pharmaceutical companies who are pushing illicit fentanyl through our postal services. Can you believe that? Now, from an infrastructure standpoint, we're, I'm not waiting for uh, a generations-long 21st century Interstate Highway Act. We immediately got on and, uh, to, to enact split tolling on the Verrazano Bridge, something that the New York City delegation has been trying to do for over 20 years. Over 20 years. Uh, the seawall, I was the first freshman to get a piece of legislation signed by the president to eliminate a bureaucratic you know, easement that was preventing us from breaking ground on the seawall. But to, to your larger point here, Congress is filled with 400 or over 400 independent contractors. 
all of whom are egotistical, self-involved, and are on two-year contracts. So it is very difficult to assume a private sector, as much as I would love this. I came out of the military. Everything's linear. We got timelines. We have phase lines. We know that we have outcomes that we have to hit. I want that to happen in Congress. And I think that there is far more potential to make it a more effective and quick institution, but that's not going to happen quickly. In the meantime, though, we are sincerely looking for these wins, and I think that we are getting them done at a faster pace than any other member, any other freshman member, for sure. Thank you for speaking. Uh, can you speak about uh, the empire outlets and sort of changing the narrative on uh, large-scale economic development issues? Sure. Uh, you know, the, for, for those of you not knee-deep in Staten Island, all that is Staten Island, the empire outlets just opened up on the uh, North Shore, right along Bay Street, near the ferry. Um, that is something that the, Jimmy, I'm giving you so many shout outs today, man. You know, the, the, the borough president uh, and the rest of the delegation on Staten Island worked long, you know, many years to get this thing done. Of course, the other side of the coin for that project was supposed to be the wheel. So much of the justification for that was the wheel. The wheel fell through. And yet another example of how government is failing in this day and age. And so we are doing our best to make sure that when people take that joy ride, the only free ferry available, potentially in the country, to see our greatest sights, that they're not just getting off and getting right back on the ferry to turn around, that they're stopping in Staten Island, visiting this new uh, empire outlets, moving on to see the beautiful institution that is Snug Harbor, going down Forest Avenue to see some of the best restaurants in New York City, um, and down Bay Street. So that's, the, the outlets have to play a role in that. But again, I go back to something I was saying earlier, because we are afflicted with this nimbyism here in this town today. This idea that, well, I know that we need more development because I know we need more tax revenue. No one says I don't want to pay our cops and our teachers more. They just don't want the development to happen in their backyard. We have to build higher in this city. If you want to truly address affordable housing, then shocker, you need more building. You have to have it. And it has to happen in your neighborhood just as much as anyone else's. And our elected officials have to be willing to give people those hard truths, but what we cannot do. And again, this is where I think these early investments as well as trust building are so important. We can't afford to say, well, the infrastructure will come later. We can't afford to say, well, that bus rapid transit is going to come 10 years from now. Buses represent the future of this town. They absolutely do. We have to get more people on our buses. We have to figure out how to have more ride sharing so we can get individual cars off the road and speed up people's commuting times. Speed up people's commute, not just to work, but to school. Or God knows to what else. Doing things concurrently and never forgetting that people have to trust in government, though, is what is so critical. I think that Staten Island, certainly, and the Empire Outlets are going to be a part of this, can be a, a true success story in that regard. Hi, um, Max, thank you for being here today. My question is, um, how do we address affordable housing, especially in New York City, where there is a lot of neighborhoods that have changed over time, um, especially how it affects people of color and minorities? Absolutely. You know, I, uh, when you go back to this Amazon thing, I found it fascinating that the people who were opposed to it, opposed to their neighborhood changing, with the very people who a decade prior had come into those neighborhoods and changed those neighborhoods just to their liking. So we have got to be cognizant of the fact that gentrification for the last 20 years, from neighborhoods from Clinton Hill all the way out to Queens, Long Island City, and there's so many others, uh, has upended people's lives. It's upended particularly families' lives who had been renters for so long and had presume that renting was equivalent to home ownership and invested in their communities, had saved communities, had stayed in communities at times where people who looked differently, who were in better socioeconomic positions, had left. Those people certainly cannot suffer. One way to start is to eliminate the perverse incentives in our rent stabilization laws. So landlords are not incentivized to kick people out of their homes so they can push something to a market rate. 
But again, I go back to this issue that nobody is talking right now, which is zoning. You truly want to address affordability, we have got to build more. More and more people will want to move and will move to New York City because that's what's happening across the country. We're seeing an increased urbanization. We're seeing an increased concentration of jobs in urban centers. And if we don't have a plan in New York City to grow to 15 million or so population in 15 years or so, and the only way can we can do that is by building up and concurrently investing in infrastructure, our schools, our sewage systems, our transportation, our police officers, then it's not gonna work. It just won't work. You know, the other thing though, I think that we, what we have to think about as we push back on gentrification, and people suffer from gentrification. I've just laid that out. I don't, want you to, I don't want you to think that I'm ignorant to that. But the fact that in many ways, when people say they want to move to New York City, it is representative of a success story that we never talk about anymore. You know, Commissioner O'Neill, you, you were on the force at a time when neighborhoods that now were, are agents of economic development were not necessarily the safest places. You and I have discussed previously ways in which we as a city can't presume that that's guaranteed, that public safety is just here to stay, that economic development is just here to stay. And there's a way to do this responsibly. There is. If you're a hardworking teacher, if you're working at McDonald's, if you're following the rules and doing the right thing, there should be a place in New York City for you. But if our politics is overtaken by nimbyism, if our politics is overtaken by a sense that we can have our cake and eat it too, then we will never get the job done and the chickens really will come home to roost. And then we'll see what this world looks like when our tax revenue is going down, when people are chronically unemployed, and when we don't have the money to build out public housing. Those chickens will come home to roost and people are gonna be faced with some very difficult decisions that we should be proactive in preventing. Yeah. You, and the borough you and the borough president seem to have a good working relationship. I would say are, are the two parties are not known for sure. at this point. Is, is, is there something about it? Is there, some, is there something that we could either learn from or kind of yeah. that, so, that you've done that you felt been very well? Yeah, you know, I, that has been a, a real highlight for me in my, in my time in office so far, working with the, the borough president across party lines, and I think we are showing an example for the rest of the city and the country. Ain't too many Republicans left in the city, but uh, in the rest of the country for how this can be done. One thing that, uh, and Jimmy, I, I would love to, to if, you, if you want to stand up and give your opinion on this as well, uh, we're not focused on taking, on who takes credit. That's one thing. Um, there's, I think, a mutual commitment that's often been unspoken that while we're not also worried about taking credit, we're not worried, I'm not nervous that he's gonna s publicly swipe me. I'm not worried that he's gonna publicly say, man, that Max Rose couldn't get the job done and that's his fault. You know, the borough president hasn't gotten his due credit for what he did with the bus reconfiguration on Staten Island because what happened was the f for one of the first times in this city, an elected official stood up and said, I'm gonna take ownership for changes to our transportation systems. Usually what happens is people just stand up and say, well, let me just wait until the MTA messes up so I can tweet at them. That's, if we continue to govern like this with social media being the primary driving force, we're never gonna see an effective government. And then, and then lastly, you know, we, we have made a, a mutual commitment not to think about just the next election. You know, uh, the campaign never stops in this day and age. It never does. You know, we, we have over 25 presidential candidates before the summer in the off year. In the off year. We have to figure out a way in this country to have the turn on an, an off button for this perpetual campaign, this perpetual hyper-partisanship. And I, I certainly think what we're doing on Staten Island is an example for how that can be done. Is there anything you want to add to all this? I, I just want to say one thing. I have on my phone <laughs> a little countdown. I have 938 days, 14 hours, and 42 minutes left in my tenure as an elected official. Of those 938 days, 500 plus 
at the very least, Max will be uh, my congressman. Um, excuse my language, everyone. My ideology as a city uh, official is to get done. And I will work with Max. I told him that. And, and, and I'm, I'm just impressed with his tenacity and his willingness to, even though he's a federal elected official, to get really granular and get on the local level and be an, an ally. On Staten Island, and this is not recent, it's always um, us against the world. That's the mentality we have. And I think the people on Staten Island don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. They want to know you are fighting with everything you have against the world to make their lives better. And I think I have an ally in that. And Max, I'm going to continue to work with him. So, thank you. Good job. Thank you, Congressman. Please join me in thanking you.